Welcome to Marine View Church Online. My name is Gary Hundrup, and I'm filling in this week for Pastor Jesse Skiffington. Marine View seeks to go deeper with Jesus and reach wider with his love. Our summer series studies the early days of the Christian church in the book of Acts. In the Bible, the New Testament begins with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those first four books all give an account about Jesus' life here on earth. The next book is Acts, and here we see the followers of Jesus living out their faith through their actions. We have three primary themes today. The first is obstacles, our resistance. Our life will have obstacles, and today we acknowledge there will be obstacles, and how best to navigate those obstacles. Second is focus. Focus shows us how to stay on track, keeping a clear understanding of Jesus' call on our life. The third theme is salvation. Salvation, which means knowing Jesus is more than an eternal vacation in paradise. We begin with Acts 4, verses 1 through 22. If you missed any of the passages up to now, you can go to the Marine View Presbyterian Church website, which is marineviewpc.org, and catch up. Last week we saw in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John healed a man lame from birth, then used that healing to talk about Jesus. This week we first see Peter and John running into obstacles, resistance about their message. Beginning with Acts 4, verse 1, we read, The priest and the captain, the temple guard, and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were still speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John and put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number who believed grew to about 5,000. What awful actions did Peter and John perform to end up in jail? They healed the person and they talked about Jesus. No law broken, no crime committed, no right incited, and yet they were put in jail. They did no harm, but still put in jail. Last week, Jesse spoke about the followers of Jesus running into resistance. A bit of an understatement with Peter and John going to jail. Why were they put in jail? The religious leaders must have been afraid or felt threatened. Those religious leaders' mindset did not allow for healings or hearing about Jesus. Last week, Jesse addressed how we can have our minds set a certain way and we will not change for anything. does not matter the real facts or new circumstances. So they asked Peter and John, by what power or name did you do this? In the chapter before this, we read that Peter and John already answered this question. In Acts 3.16, they said, by faith, in the name of Jesus, the man you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. The religious leaders already had the answer to their question, but they did not like the answer, so they put Peter and John in prison, then asked them again, maybe hoping they would apologize or give some other answer. The first point this morning is we will have obstacles and resistance in our life, especially when we engage in beneficial or helpful tasks. What evil or wrong did Peter and John commit when they healed the lame person? There will always be someone who will find fault with any positive task committed. The more positive task the louder someone will complain. 
I bet every one of you can think of at least one time you tried to do something positive and there was at least one person finding fault with it. My experience has been the greater the positive task taken on, the louder the complaints by at least one person and sometimes several people. So if we try to reach others with our faith in Jesus, it should not surprise us that we may meet resistance and obstacles. Note here where the resistance comes from. It came from the religious leaders of that day. They were hardened by their own mindset and could not see God working in a new way. Or they simply had a limited view of God and did not want anyone else to have a broader understanding of of God. Religious communities and religious leaders seeking to hinder God's love reaching a broader community is not limited to the people of Jesus' day. It can spring up at any time with anybody. Second point this morning concerns staying focused. Peter answers their question about what power or name they did the healing and speaking. Here we read this in Acts 4, 8 through 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is a stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Peter stays on task and focused in the midst of this resistance to what they have done. Peter says, basically, are you upset because we showed an act of kindness to the lame man? Then he says it is through Jesus that this person was healed. He spoke some strong words to them when he said this. He said, you are the ones that crucified Jesus. It was the religious leaders of that day that sought the crucifixion of Jesus. Notice they did not argue or yell about the phrase, whom you crucified. However, Peter stays focused on the important part of their goal, having people look to Jesus. He did not go on and on about them having Jesus crucified or how silly they looked getting upset because someone was healed. Peter wanted to look to Jesus, for in Jesus there is salvation, completeness, wholeness, restoration. This brings us to our third point this morning, salvation. Peter points to Jesus as our salvation and how we are saved. In looking at Jesus' words and life here on earth, I believe salvation involves the totality of our life here on earth and into eternity. There are times in our lives when we cannot even think about death and the possibility of heaven and hell because we are already experiencing hell. Jesus can walk with us right now, even if we see ourselves in a dark pit with no light and no hope. I think that is why Jesus healed people, so we could visibly see the invisible healing and wholeness that can come to our lives right here and right now. This can happen by knowing who is Jesus and immersing ourselves in Jesus. One of the resistances and obstacles in our lives is when we begin to focus on religious leaders or religious movements that no longer focus on the love and compassion of Jesus. We see this when religious leaders and movements begin to press various rules and regulations over a relationship with Jesus. When people begin to have a closed mindset rather than looking to see how God is working in ways previously not understood. Then it becomes a wall to seeing the real Jesus. 
Even Peter, the very one in this passage encouraging a relationship with Jesus, this same Peter we read in Galatians chapter 2, how he separated himself from the Gentiles and only stayed with the more elite circumcised group. He began to live a rules-based religion and not a faith-based relationship with Jesus. Peter only did this for a time, but it shows how easy it is to miss the fullness of all Jesus has to offer. Salvation in Jesus is about a wholeness and completeness that begins in this life, no matter what is happening to us. In the 1980s, I was an assistant pastor at a church in Bremerton, Washington. During that time, I also briefly volunteered to be a chaplain for the fire department. When I was a chaplain, a mom had a junior high school daughter turn up missing. So I was called to be with the mom while they searched for the daughter. On about the second or third day of the search, I got a call from the Kitsap Sheriff's Office to meet with the sheriff at the parking lot where the headquarters was for the search. When I got there, the sheriff met me, put his arm around me, and walked me towards a trailer and told me that the mom's daughter had just been found murdered. He took me to the trailer to meet with the mom. Now think about this mom. Is she thinking about eternal life right now? Not at this moment. Finding out her daughter has just been murdered, she's trying to make it through the next 30 seconds. Unfortunately, there are times in our lives that we struggle to make it through the next 30 seconds. When I walked into the trailer, the first thing the mom said to me was, why did God kill my daughter? When she said that, everything slowed down for me. It was as if time had stopped. My first thought was, wrong question. I'd already formulated a number of answers to other questions she might ask, but not, why did God kill her daughter? There were about seven to eight people in the room, including various officials and support staff, along with the mom's high school son. I knew this was not a time for a theological discussion about sin and evil in the world, and that it was not God who killed her son. This mom was hurting, struggling, and there was no answer in the world that would lessen that pain. So I gave the wrong theological answer. The mom asked, why did God kill my daughter? And I said, I don't know. Now, to be clear, I know God did not kill her daughter. But I believe in that moment, by the grace of God, I gave that mom room to hurt. I have revisited in my mind that conversation hundreds of times and still believe, again, by the grace of God, that my answer was the best answer at that moment. I was with that mom and her son over the next several days. She was visiting from Idaho, and the day before she went back home, she told me that she knew God did not kill her daughter. She had begun to have a slight peace in her life. She believed that God was with her, even though she felt immense pain with the loss of her daughter. Salvation and being saved by Jesus can begin right here, right now, and is not just a desire to live in heaven for all eternity. To experience the salvation Jesus offers requires focus on Jesus. We need to read and reread the life of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to know all we can about Jesus' exact life and words. I believe misguided religious actions by leaders and movements come as people take selected passages out of the context of Jesus' words and ministries. Our thoughts, life, and actions will be most effective when they show the love and compassion of Jesus, which can only come as we allow Jesus' words and heart to permeate our heart and soul. We will face obstacles and resistance of all kinds, and we will face them in our faith. Some of those obstacles and resistance will come from religious leaders and religious movements. 
Other obstacles and resistance come from circumstances that happen in this world. They just happen. Only by knowing Jesus, reading Jesus' words, emulating Jesus' life, can we see clearly who Jesus calls us to be and what to do, rather than purely relying on others who may or may not emulate Jesus. If people we look up truly emulate the love and compassion of Jesus, showing the fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control, then that shows the heart of Jesus and is worth listening to. In our life and in our faith, we will face resistance and obstacles at times. If we keep our focus on Jesus, then we can best navigate those obstacles. Keeping our focus on Jesus is a daily process, which can build reserves up for those unexpected crashes that will come. Salvation is the result of a faith in Jesus and walk with Jesus. Salvation through Jesus gives us the ability to navigate the joys and the devastations in this life.